By the time of the First World War, the means available for war had overwhelmed and grown beyond any conceivable purpose for which the war might be fought. If you were going to fight a great power war, then necessarily it was going to be a war of millions of men facing one another with artillery, with tanks. That is what a war was going to be if you were going to fight one at that time. And that was the tragedy of the First World War. And that was why so many millions had died. It was because of this transformation that had occurred in the character of warfare. The armies on each side were just thrown into this gap where they were chewed up. It was a zone of absolute horror, but in a rather limited area. Uh, and it was a, a war of horror for soldiers, much more than it for civilians. At the beginning of the 20th century, the idea of the war poet was not an anti-war poet. The, the war poet was someone who was in the war, probably an officer who had been educated at Cambridge or Oxford, with these very refined sensibilities. These were not 20th century poets. Uh, up until the moment that they experienced these bombardments and this, this horrific mass slaughter. Sassoon was a decorated soldier, a man of, of legendary courage. He was known as Mad Jack because of his, uh, uh, his bombing exploits. He used to go out um, at night uh, on patrol with a pocket full of hand grenades and throw them at the enemy and, and then come back again. But Sassoon's poems deliver a tremendous sort of shock does it matter, losing your legs? For people will always be kind, and you need not show that you mind when the others come in after hunting to gobble their muffins and eggs. Does it matter, losing your sight? There's such splendid work for the blind, and people will always be kind as you sit on the terrace remembering and turning your face to the light. World War I, uh, particularly with the British poets, um, I think we see that they were brought up in a very romantic era. Uh, their concept of war was uh, built on the uh, 17 and 1800s, where uh, battles were fought one-on-one -on -one with dignity. And they found themselves in trenches, uh, confronted with modern technology, concertina, machine guns, uh, things that they had not expected. And the war was long and drawn out. Sassoon made this public protest. He wrote to his commanding officer, saying, I am a soldier, speaking for soldiers, and I must protest that the war on which I entered as a war of uh, defense has now become a war of aggression and conquest. I am making this statement as an act of willful defiance of military authority. I am a soldier. I have seen and endured the sufferings of the troops, and I can no longer be a party to prolong these sufferings for ends which I believe to be evil and unjust. I suppose it's not unthinkable that he could have been court-martialed and shot for that. But he was, a, he, was a, he was something of a hero because of his, he had the military cross, he had a medal, the public knew him. The government were, were severely embarrassed by this. Sassoon was whisked away to Edinburgh, a long way from London, and sent to a military hospital called Craig Lockhart, which was a hospital for people suffering from shell shock. Sassoon was rather bored by uh, newcomers. He didn't really want to meet anybody else while he was at Craig Lockhart. He was ashamed of being there anyway. He felt he was a failure. He felt he'd been silenced by authority and he shouldn't have given in. So he wasn't terribly enthusiastic when Owen knocked on his door, but Owen, on the other hand, was immensely excited to meet a published poet. And they did eventually become close friends, very close friends, I think, and they found they had a great deal in common. <laughs> 